This morning we're going to look at Psalm 100, a message I've entitled, Service with a Smile. I want that to be true of me, our leadership, and you, and this church in 2022. If someone encounters us, comes here on a Sunday morning, or encounters you wherever life has you, I trust that they will encounter Christian service with a smile. Listen to Psalm 100. In fact, let's stand in honor of God's Word. Follow along in your copy of the Bible. Psalm 100. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. So reads God's word. You may be seated. Andrew Bonner was the brother of the famous hymn writer Horatius Bonner and the close friend to Robert Murray McShane. The three men were Scottish Presbyterians, and Andrew Bonner was a man known for his boundless joy and his endless hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, in the early days of a lifelong work in a needy area in Glasgow, Scotland, when things were small and times were hard, a friend asked him how things were going, to which Andrew Bonner replied, oh, we're looking for great things. Now, kind of knowing that things were small and times were hard, his friend kind of uh, admonished him not to expect too much. To which Bonner replied, with God we can never hope for too much. He had a marvelous sense of humor. And on one occasion he exuded that kind of joy in visiting one of his congregation who was laid low with sickness. And as he bounded into his home, he said to this man, I have a new medicine for you this morning. A merry heart does good like a, good, like a medicine. In fact, a young child in his congregation said that Andrew Bonner was the minister with a laughing face. Now put that all together and we get a profile of a man who served the Lord with a smile, who served the Lord with gladness, as we read here in Psalm 100 and verse 2. Read the life of Andrew Bonner, and you'll find the story of a man who lived, loved, and laughed out loud. A little child encountered her minister and went away thinking about his laughing face. He had a smile on his face, and by the time he was done with his congregation, they had a smile on their face. So as we refocus and rededicate ourselves at the start of this new year, let's resolve, like Andrew Bonner, to serve the Lord with a smile. Let's go about gospel work, not grudgingly, but gladly. Let's fulfill Psalm 37, verse 4. Let us delight in the Lord and let Him give us the desires of our heart. The God who loved us so lavishly in Christ, doesn't He deserve our joy? He deserves nothing less. I want you to know this morning that joy is a serious thing with God. Joy is is a serious thing with God. In fact, if you go back to Deuteronomy 28, verse 47 to 48, and I'll, and I'll bet you you haven't read these verses in a while. Maybe that's not the way to, way to put it. Pastors shouldn't be betting. But, but, but here, here's what you've got. Deuteronomy 28, verse 47. Because you did not serve the Lord with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything, you're going to serve your enemies. God threatens terrible things on His people when they don't serve Him with joy. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> if you're not happy, I'll make you unhappy. That's, that's powerful. In fact, that verse is to be found at the beginning of his marvelous book, Desiring God, by John Piper. 
And he goes on to talk about the fact that God is most greatly glorified in me when I am most deeply satisfied in Him. That's a new take on the Westminster Confession, which is so biblical and so Protestant and so right. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God? Does it stop there? And enjoy Him forever. If the chief end of man is to enjoy God, the chief goal of 2022 is to be a happy Christian and a joyful follower of Jesus Christ. You and I ought to be radiating happiness. Psalm 144 verse 15, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. You and I ought to be happy. Our, our services ought to be happy. You've heard the story of the little girl who was looking around the walls of the church and she saw plaques and pendants. And she asked her father, what was, what was that about? And he says, well, those are the names of, of, of those who died in the services. To which you replied, is that the morning service or the evening service? <laughs> Sadly, that's, that's the, 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 the testimony of, of many where so many church services border on boredom. And the sludge of religious solemnity and sobriety is what they encounter. Joy and not melancholy is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. What does Paul say about the kingdom of God in Romans 14, 17? The kingdom of God isn't eating and drinking. The kingdom of God is joy and peace and righteousness. When I was growing up, I sat under a pastor in Northern Ireland called Ivan Thompson. And one thing Ivan hated was unhappy Christians. In fact, he's reported to have visited a church as a guest speaker, and he encountered two deacons in the foyer of the church who were handing out bulletins, and they were so sour and so dour that he asked one of them if he could borrow their face for Halloween. He said, stop scaring the children. <laughs> in fact, on another occasion, it is said in a former church that at the end of a service, he was ambushed by a complaining Christian. Who, who, would, know, who would believe that? <laughs> but but on, rather than indulging him, he said to this brother, you know what? I've still other people here to receive in the line. Would you mind going into that room and waiting on me there? The brother did that dutifully. Ivan shook hands, and then he said to one of his deacons, I'm going to go home here. Let him out in about 20 minutes. <laughs> Tell him I was called away. Now, that, that might seem unbecoming of a minister, but you know what? We do need to lock a bunch of Christians in a room until they get happy, and then we can let them out for the sake of the gospel witness. Because according to Psalm 100, we're to make a joyful noise to the Lord. We're to serve Him with gladness. We're to come into His presence with singing. We're to enter His gates with thanksgiving. And yet so often that is not the case. That is not the experience of men. And yes, we're to be sober, but not somber. There is a difference. Sunny souls... And smiling faces are not expressions of shallowness or superficiality. See, it's Spurgeon had a little couplet that went something like this. Virtue does not lie in gravity, and smiles are not symptoms of depravity. Serve the Lord with a smile. That's the challenge of Psalm 100. So keep your Bible open as we work our way through the text. This is a psalm that answers the who, the what, and the why of worship. It's a crash course in worship. It will tell us who to worship. We have a description of God and His many attributes. It will tell us in what way to worship, joyfully and loudly and gladly. And it will tell us why to worship, because His mercy is everlasting and His truth endures for all generations. You need to understand this. Being saved does not guarantee true worship of the true God. You need to be instructed on how to worship. Just being saved doesn't guarantee that. So I want to know about the who, the what, and the why. 
Now, let me just put this text in its context, which we always do here at Kindred. This brief psalm brings, uh, brings us to um, a, a category of psalms called homage psalms. You know, there are different genres of psalms. There are lament psalms, there are celebration psalms, there are trust psalms, there are redemptive historical psalms, there are enthronement psalms. Well, this is a homage psalm. There's a series of them beginning in Psalm 93, and here's the capstone in Psalm 100. And they reflect the, the, the language of monarch and servant because they're focused on God as the heavenly king. That's why we're, the kind of language here is how do you enter his court? What's the royal protocol for addressing and adoring the heavenly king? Some argue, um, Alan Ross in his majestic commentary on the Psalms says that the background may be the collapse of the Davidic monarchy. So in the middle of crisis nationally and politically, they are reminded of the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So, three things. I'm going to gather our thoughts here around three things. Number one, we're called to shout. We're called to serve. And we're called to salute. That is, recognize the goodness of God in thanksgiving. Shout, serve, salute. Let's begin at verse one. Make a joyful shout. You didn't know that was in your Bible, did you? Pentecostals love this verse. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. No long faces, no hushed tones, no restrained emotions. The worship was to be exuberant, lively, noisy, and pulsating with passion for God. In fact, listen to these words from um, a Southern Baptist uh, theologian, Mervyn uh, Tate. The enthusiasm of Israelite worship is illustrated throughout Psalms 93 to 100. Those are the homage psalms. Shouts are raised, praises chanted, and sung while musical instruments are played and horns are blown. Listen to this. The noise of the temple worship was legendary. The hushed tones of a European cathedral don't match the noise of the temple. The noise of the temple was legendary. Tambourines, lyres, trumpets, horns, cymbals, people shouting, some dancing. Call to shout. In fact, this term, shout in the Hebrew, is a festal term. It, it, it speaks of um, the shout at the end of military conquest. Gives you a little flavor of what we're talking about, you know. Um, the kind of celebration went on in VE Day after the Second World War where you can see people in Rome and London and Paris shouting and celebrating a military conquest. That's our word. It's a festal term. It's used of um, the, the announcing of a king's presence and the, the joy and the, and the noise that comes with that. Maybe, maybe something uh, akin would be when you've gone to a, a national football game or a, uh, an N NBA game or an NHL game in the stadium, at some point on the jumbotrons, what do you get? Make some noise. Make some noise. And then, you know, the volume comes up and the clapping starts slow and, and, and small and then begins to just reverberate around the stadium. Psalm 100 is kind of like that. Make some noise in your walk and worship with God. Now, let me, before we get into that, let me strike a word of qualification and a, and a, and, and a word of balance. Because while this text calls us to excitement and exuberance, it's only one voice by which we can worship God, right? The prophet Isaiah said, were, said what? Let the earth be silent. Ecclesiastes 3 tells us there's a time to speak and there's a time to be silent. And if you look at the Psalms in the different genres, there are Psalms of celebration, but there are Psalms of lament. And so while I love this and I want this and we need to express this, it can't be this all the time. It shouldn't be this all the time. One size of worship doesn't fit all experiences or occasions. Um, listen to this from uh, Tim or Jim 
Br- uh, Breeze Bridger. Um, he, he writes on this psalm, comparing Psalm 98 and 88, for example, it's immediately obvious that we are reading two different very kinds of literature. Psalm 98 is full of confident celebration and feels as if it should be sung with the accompaniment of a full orchestra, or if you prefer, a rock band. But while Psalm 88 expresses unrelenting personal agony, it feels as if it should be sung in a minor key to the accompaniment of a single violin. I love the drama and the imagery of that. There's some songs and songs that should be sung with the full orchestra, others with the single violin. But here we are, Psalm 100 celebratory. It, it, this is loud, noisy. This is a full orchestra expression of worship. Now, there's three things about the shout I want us to see quickly. Number one, it's international. There's an, it's an international shout. Look at this. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. This call to worship the Lord jubilantly and joyfully is issued to all the earth. Now, while it is, it is um, directed uh, to Israel, it is also issued to every nation um, outside of that nation. This psalm claims the world for God. The five continents, the seven seas, right? Why? Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's his anyway. He made it. And we are we his people and the sheep of his pasture. And that's true of the Jew and the Gentile. It's true of Israel and every other nation. What about Psalm 98, 4 to 9? Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Bring forth in song, rejoice and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp, the sound of a psalm, trumpets, horns. Look at verse 7. Let the sea roar in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for He is coming as judge of all the earth. That, that's, that's striking. And, and it, it, it is a reminder to, to, to fight the danger that in worship we get caught up with the moment with ourselves, with the kind of worship we like, and, and, and things between us and God get very personal, and, and not all of that's wrong. But, but here's, here's a call to worship that seems to push down the four walls of the temple and has this congregation worshiping God, but thinking about missions, thinking about the world at large. John Piper, in his book, Let the Nations Be Glad, said this. It's very striking. Missions exist because worship doesn't. In John 4, isn't it interesting that the Great Commission is, is cast in terms of calling people to worship? The Father seeks such to worship Him. We go into all the world to make disciples of the, of the nations so that they may get back to their purpose in life, which is worshiping the God that gave them life. And so when you and I worship, it can't be about us. When you and I worship, we've got to be thinking missions, evangelism, the Great Commission. We want every nation in the world to resound to the noise of the celebration of the Creator and Maker of all living things and the One who has loved us in Jesus Christ. When we worship, we want God to bless us, our family, our church, but our community, our state, our nation. Not just America, but Africa. Not just Africa, but Asia. Philip Brooks, the Bostonian pastor, said, you cannot believe the gospel for yourself without believing the gospel for the whole world. When you're caught up in worship, you're caught up in the thought of God's glory, and your heart aches that men and women around you in your community and on your street are robbing him of his glory that today they're polishing their cars and shining their boats and heading out into his creation without any thought of the Creator. That provokes us to say, 
Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands, you neighbors, you fellow countrymen. Not only is it an international shout, it's an intense shout. Kind of going back over what we've already established, that there's an intensity, a volume of an excitement to their singing. The, the, The noise of the temple was legendary. Verse 1, make a joyful shout to the Lord. Verse 2, serve him with gladness. Come before him with singing. Verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. What, what, what is being talked about here is a group of people who love to love God. Who are glad when they say, let us go to the house of of God. The worship of God in this context was delightful, not doleful, radiant, not restrained. In fact, their worship was a full body workout. It was not just voice, it was, it was hands, it was feet. You read, read the Psalms and you'll find people clapping and shouting and dancing. And worship ought to be expressed that way on occasions. It ought to move us. And we ought to move, be moved, move with being moved by it. Now, I know temperament and I know background and upbringing will play something into that. But we've got to find ways to express ourselves to the Lord joyfully and loudly. Um, some time ago, um, some young couples in the church invited June and I to a Chris Tomlin uh, concert here in Orange County, and, and many of them had come out of Calvary Chapel backgrounds and were much more expressive in their worship than June and I were. And there we were in the midst of these young couples, hands up, loving it, moving. June and I were standing like two mannequins. <laughs> enjoying it, but not expressing it. In fact, Thomas Pertell, one of our elders, was a couple of rows by, and he shouts down to me, Pastor, are you not enjoying it? You want to move a little bit? I said, Thomas, my toes are wiggling. That's as far as I'm going. But I'm enjoying it. Now, both of those stances can be expressions of worship. You can get as far as your toe wiggling, or you can get as far as jumping up and down like a mad person. The psalmist would would challenge me to be a a little more unreserved, to shout to the Lord and serve Him with gladness and sing heartily. Um, Years ago, I I read the story of of a wonderful man of God, Billy Bray. You probably don't know about him. It's kind of lost in the dust of history. But he was a coal miner in Cornwall, England, blue collar, got radically saved and radically showed it. In fact, um, he said of himself, they said I was a mad man, but they meant a glad man. In fact, he was accosted one day for his exuberance and excitement. He said, I can't help it. I can't help praising God, he argued. As I go along the street, I lift one foot up and it seems to say glory. And I lift the other foot up and it seems to say amen. And when I walk, it's glory and amen. He said, on another occasion, he has made me glad and no man will make me sad. He has made me shout and no one will make me doubt. Finally, He was famous for saying this, if they put me in a barrel, I will shout glory through the bunghole. Where where is that today? We need to hear this international shout, and we need to hear this intense shout, and we need to hear finally this informed shout. This is important because while I'm challenging myself to, to, to make sure I'm not f- afraid to be emotional and physical in my expression of worship, I want to challenge those who are emotional and physical in their expression to be thoughtful. Because this isn't just intense joy, this is informed joy. Look at our text. Make a joyful shout. We get it. Serve the Lord with gladness. We get it. 
What about verse 3? But know the Lord, know that the Lord is God. He made you, not yourself. You're his people, sheep of his pasture. Know the Lord. That's intellectual. That's an appeal to the mind. This text is no mere burst of undisciplined emotion. They were to be exultant in spirit, but they were also to be enlightened in their worship. Their worship, joyful and expressive as it was to be, was also to be deep and wide in the knowledge of God. It wasn't to be ignorant noise. It was to be informed worship. Radiant, yes. Rowdy, sometimes, but always reasonable. No The Lord is God. Know it. Study it. This is more than a mere mental nod. This is a real assimilation which becomes assurance and conviction. Their worship was fueled and framed by a deep and widening knowledge and understanding, number one, of God as sovereign. Verse 3, know that the Lord, He is God. Number two, creator. He's the one that made us. Number three, Redeemer. He's the one that has made us his people through redemption, and he has shown us his mercy, verse 5. To know him and understand him as shepherd, for we are the sheep of his pasture, and lawgiver, he has revealed himself, and his truth endures forever. This isn't mindless emotion. This is theological reflection set on fire. And we want both. I think it was Lloyd-Jones who said famously of preaching an exposition, it's logic on fire. We want pastors with heads and hearts working in unison. We want heat and light. And what's true of exposition is true of worship. What is worship? It's logic set on fire. It's you meditating on the attributes of God. It's you measuring the love of God and its breadth and depth in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's you studying the great and exceeding promises of God. And when you assimilate it and you appropriate it and it assures you worship results where you want to shout through the bunghole, glory. Where your feet goes glory and your other foot goes amen. Listen to these words by John Rise Bridger, who I quoted earlier. I like these words. They're challenging, and they're right on, 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 on the money. In the Bible, worship is never a mere feeling to be worked up. It is always a response to what God has revealed of himself. Worship has its reasons. It is not the uh, ephemeral froth on a religious life that vanishes the moment a meeting is over. It rests on something secure. George Mueller, you've read maybe of something of his life, uh, famous for um, finding the Ashley Down Orphanage in England. Over his lifetime, he cared for over 10,000 orphans, started 117 schools, which educated 120,000 children. His impact was deep and wide. He was asked late in life what his secret was. He replied in his 80s, gathering himself up, he said this, I know my God and my God knows me. He was informed. And what informed him inspired him. In fact, if you read something of his earlier years, you'll know he also famously said that after time, I realized that the first business of the day was to make my soul happy in the Lord. Okay, he said, I found for a while I rushed out into the day, demands, deadlines dominated. I realized, no, I I can't, I can't go and serve the Lord without having spent time with the Lord. And so he said, my first business of the day is to make my soul happy in the Lord. And if you read about his, his pursuit of that, you'll also read that he, he learned to change the order of things. Early in his life, he prayed, and then he studied. And he found himself struggling to pray, to warm up in his prayers, to get to a place of thanksgiving and gratitude and worship. And so he flipped it. 
And he recommends that we do that. He said, you know what? What I did, I meditated on the word first. And then I prayed. In fact, he said, the more I meditated on the word and learned something about God's character, the depth of his love, the marvel of his mercy, I just started spontaneously in the midst of my meditation, giving thanks, worshiping, praising. Make your soul happy in the Lord. Be a joyful Christian. Be exuberant, excited. But realize you also need to be educated in the word and schooled in the spirit and the gospel. So that's the call to shout. Number two, called to serve. Called to serve. Verse two, serve the Lord with gladness. Ministry is a privilege. What a privilege to serve those children across the patio. What a privilege to welcome people onto our campus. What a privilege to get the coffee and donuts out to the troops on a Sunday morning. What a privilege. What a privilege for me to stand and open God's Word. What a privilege for our people to take instruments and and cause the people of God to sing to their Creator amidst the creation in the hope of a new creation. Serve the Lord with gladness. I wish that was true of me all the time. I wish that was true of you all the time. It's not, but it should be. The Christian is to be a happy worshiper. Psalm 122, verse 1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Can I paraphrase that? Can't wait for Sunday. Can't. We should be happy students of the Scripture David says in Psalm 1 verse 2, I delight to meditate on your law day and night. We should be happy givers. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And we should be happy servants of the gospel. 1 Thessalonians 2, 16 to 18, Paul writes about his time at Thessalonica and he said, you were my joy and my crown of rejoicing. We're to serve the Lord with mirth, his praise forth tale. I think it was Thomas Carlyle, who was no Christian, who said, give me a man who sings at his work. That's a good little statement. Give me a man who sings at his work. Give me a Christian who's glad to serve the Lord. He is the best and most effective servant while they're preaching sermons, pounding nails, playing music, who sees the glory of it and seeks the glory of God in it. I have a friend, Dutchman, John Van Wingerden, got a large flower-growing business in Ohio. And one day we were talking about attitude, talking about disposition. We were actually talking about a mutual friend who was struggling in a struggling situation. Well, we concluded his attitude was wrong. And as hard as it was, he still needed to serve the people gladly. He still needed to do things right. And in the middle of that discussion, John said this, we have a Dutch, the Dutch have a saying, if not gladly, not at all. If not gladly, not at all. Now, in a fallen world, I'd love to believe we could achieve that 100% of the time. But boy, it'd be good if we could even get the 90% of the time. If not gladly, not at all. Serve the Lord with gladness. But the thing that catches my imagination in this idea of serving the Lord with gladness is serving the Lord as an act of worship. You might have an ESV and it translates it worship, which is a, a fine and reasonable translation. Worship the Lord with gladness. Because you see, the Hebrew term is interchangeable. Worship is service and service is worship. And no doubt in this context, the service being rendered was service in the prescribed times of worship in the location of the temple. But the text here certainly wouldn't want to limit that. It would want to take that idea on a road test. Because we're to serve the Lord with gladness, not just in the hour of prayer or on the Lord's day, but on every day. Biblical theology teaches us That worship is far more than the singing of songs. We worship the Lord by serving, and that includes service outside the house of worship. 
Remember, under the old covenant, God had a temple for his people. There was a prescribed priesthood. There was a place to go to. There were literal courts to enter and gates to go through. But under the new covenant, every self-propagating, self-sustaining, Christ-centered Bible-preaching church with a regenerate membership, that's a temple. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. And every Christian alive in a body is a temple because your body is what? The temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Now, just pause. That's radical. That's radical. This building and you equate to all the majesty, all the pomp and all the ceremony of the temple and the priesthood. This is a temple. You are priests and you are walking, talking temples, which means that wherever you step is holy ground. And whatever you do can be an act of service. That's why when Billy Graham was preaching the gospel all around the world, his wife Ruth had a little plaque above her kitchen sink, worship rendered here three times a day. Now, Billy was worshiping in his preaching. Ruth was worshiping and cleaning the dishes. Wow, that's radical. That, that demolishes the wall between the sacred and the, and the secular. That challenges you not to compartmentalize your Christian life. That you're, you're holier on a Sunday than you are on a Monday? What's with that? That somehow singing on a Sunday morning is worship, but playing a game of soccer, listening to orchestral music can't be worship. All of life can be worship. All of life is worship. In fact, Paul uses that, that language. He uses the language of worship. He uses the terminology of the temple, and he uses the language of the liturgy. And here's what he says to the Christians in Rome. What does he say? So he says, hey, I, I, I want to appeal to you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. All right? Not a dead one, like an Old Testament sacrifice, but a living one. Holy, acceptable to God, which is, notice, your reasonable service. There's the word reason again. All our worship has got to be informed and reasonable and of, of theological and intellectual reflection, but it's reasonable service. So you might have a translation, it's your logical worship, because worship and service are interchangeable. But notice the language. You're a sacrifice, and everything you touch can be holy and made acceptable to God if it's done for His glory and according to His law. So, so entering the gates of a factory and doing an honest day's work is as much an act of worship as an Old Testament saint entering the gates of the temple built under Solomon and served by Levitical priests. I bet you never thought about that when the horn blew and your overalls were dusty and dirty. And you maybe started dreaming in your head, I wish I could serve the Lord like the pastor does. You know, am I living my life? I'm not a missionary. Maybe I'm not as dedicated to the Lord Jesus as I should be. Well, that may all be true, but don't be, don't be saying that simply because you're in a pair of overalls. You're in a factory and the horn just blew on a Monday morning. You and I can live for God's glory with the whole of our lives, right? What about Colossians 3? to kind of wrap this second thought up. Verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God. Verse 22, bond servants obey in all things your masters. We're in the workplace now, according to the flesh, not with eye service as man pleases, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily. Do it well. Do an honest day's work, a hard day's work. Be a person that sings at their work. Monday morning is as much a, a thing of worship as Sunday morning. 
A a church's worship and a Christian's devotion does not start and stop with what happens in the hour or so we meet together on a Sunday morning. Someone said this. I thought this was good. I took it out of a book on worship. To say I'm going to church to worship is as silly as saying I'm off to bed to breathe for a while. (laughs) Worship like breathing defines your whole life. According to Paul, we are living sacrifices, seeking to worship God in every aspect of our lives, whether at work, rest, or play. In fact, we don't have time to develop this, but I want you to go home and read Romans 12 and 13. Because Romans 12 and 13 outlines what it is to be a living sacrifice, what it is to do reasonable service and logical worship, what it is to prove and do the will of God. Verses 3 to 8, it's in relationship to ourselves. Don't think too highly of yourself. Understand your giftedness and develop your gifts and apply them for the glory of God. That's worship. Number two, in relation to other Christians, according to verses 9 to 16, you've got to love them and forgive them and serve alongside them. According to chapter 12, verses 17 to 21, it's in relationship to your enemies. You want to worship God, then when somebody does you evil, you do good. When somebody hurts you, you forgive them. Pour coals on their head. Leave room for the judgment of God. What about chapter 13, 1 to 7? What does it mean to worship God beyond singing? It means to submit to the government. It means to be a good citizen, a a contributing citizen to your nation's wealth and health. And in verses 8 to 14 of chapter 13, it's all about living according to God's standards and law. We need to, we need to grasp that, that, that service is worship and worship is service. I recently heard a speech by a Christian leader who said that the average 70-year-old man has spent a total of 24 years sleeping 14 years working at a job, eight years engaged in various amusements, six years sitting at the dining table, five years in transportation, four years in conversation, three years in education, two years in studying and reading. His other four years were spent in miscellaneous pursuits except for the hour he spent every Sunday at church, as well as about five minutes per day engaged in prayer. This amounts to a tremendous total of five months that the average seven-year-old man gives to God over his lifespan. Now, that's only true if you believe that the hour of worship and your devotions before God are worship, start and finish. But um, your job, your dining room table, your school class, your schoolroom, those are all places you and I can indeed worship God. Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, who along with other reformers regained the idea of the priesthood of believers, said this, the the work of monks and priests, however holy and arduous they may be, do not differ one whit in the sight of God from the works of the laborer in the field or the woman going about her housework, but that all works are measured before God by faith alone. Indeed, the menial housework of a manservant or a maidservant is often more acceptable to God than all the fasting and works of the monk or the priest because the monk or priest lacks faith. Theirs is an empty show of religion while the maid, milking the cow, is worshiping God in her heart and dedicating all she does to God's glory. Let's move to the last thought, called to salute, called to salute. Verses 4 and 5, back to Psalm 100. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. I love it. Finally, as they come into God's presence with singing and into his courts with praise, it was incumbent upon them to remember that the password was thanksgiving. Just metaphorically speaking, when they got to the temple, because that's the language of entering the gates. When they got to the temple, metaphorically speaking, a Levite, a worship leader, or a priest would stop them and go, what's the password? And they would have to say thanksgiving. Okay, you can enter, because you can only enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart. 
Love that. Can you imagine that? The gatekeepers, the worship leaders, the priests outside the temple saying to people as they entered, come with thanksgiving, come with praise. Maybe we should make that a new rule for our ushers. All right? You don't get in until you put a smile in your face. Hey, buddy, where's the smile? (laughs) What about, are you coming with thanksgiving? You don't get in. Otherwise, not be radical, but it's the kind of enforcement and implication of this text. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. This is the royal protocol. Remember, this is a, a psalm a homage psalm, a psalm about the heavenly king, maybe being written and sung during the collapse of the Davidic monarch, monarchy. But there was a protocol. You and I know there's all kinds of protocols. You can't just go up and ring the bell at Buckingham Palace and ask to have an, uh, 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 you know, an audience with the queen. Every king or queen has a royal protocol. The kings of Persia forbid anyone on pain of death from coming into their presence without an invitation. In fact, there's a story in the 15th century of a Romanian ruler who was so incensed when a group of Turkish envoys refused to take their turbans off in his presence that he ordered his guards to nail their turbans to their heads. Ouch. You get the point. You don't come waltzing in to the presence of a queen or a king. There's protocol, there's royal etiquette and court manners. And here's ours. You better come with thanksgiving, praise. You better be thankful to him, verse 4, and bless his name. For, here's the reason, he's good. For, his mercy is everlasting. For, his truth endures to all generations. We enter God's gates. We bless him for his unfailing goodness and generosity, constant mercy, and enduring truth. Love it. There's always something to be thankful for, right? That's why 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18 says, Give thanks to the Lord in everything, for this is the will of God for you. You and I are living a life of grace, God's undeserved favor, which means we should be living a life of gratitude. In fact, you know that the word grace and gratitude come from the same family of Greek words, kairos, grace, gratitude, kindness. The man who is not awake to the need for gratitude has fallen asleep in life. In fact, as I paused on my study, I wrote down a few things about gratitude, why it's so important that we cultivate a spirit of gratitude, that we're thankful to him, that we bless his name. Number one, because gratitude is an act of justice. Somewhere in the Psalms, it says something like this, give thanks to the Lord for it is good. That's a a word that means morally good, right. Give thanks to the Lord because it's right. It's the right thing to do. If someone does you, you know, a favor or a kindness, isn't it right that you thank them? If someone holds a door open for you at the Starbucks and you walk through, thank them. It's only right. Someone said that thanksgiving or thankfulness is a species of justice. My friend, if God is good, and He is, and God is merciful, and he is, and his truth endures forever, and it does, it's only right that we thank him for our Bibles, that they're a light onto our path and lamp onto our feet. It's only right that we realize that we should be going to hell, but we're not because of the mercy of God. It's only right that with John Newton we say amazing grace, amazing goodness, Let's see if they're rats like me. Gratitude is an act of justice. Secondly, gratitude is a grace thing. We're saved by grace, aren't we? God's undeserved favor. 
In fact, Paul says to the Corinthians, just to kind of burst their bubble, what have you got that you didn't first receive? And so you and I are alive today because of the grace of God. Life is a gift. Breath is a gift. Friendship and family and freedom and food, all gifts. And if you and I appreciate that, and we should, then we should give thanks because gratitude is an act of justice. Gratitude is a grace thing. Thirdly, gratitude is a means of protection. Gratitude is a means of protection. It will protect you against pride. It will protect you against arrogance. It will protect you by taking too much credit to yourself for where you are and what you have. Gratitude is a witness to an ungrateful world. Read Romans 1. The fall of man, the judgment of God, the kind of world we live in and why it is the way it is, Romans 1. And one of the things it talks about man who decided to worship the creation rather than the creator and the creature rather than the creator, it says of him, and he was, and he was unthankful. He did not give God thanks. The world in which we live is an ungrateful world. It doesn't pause to praise God ever, but you should. I, I think you don't want to be slavish about it, but that's, that's a good custom to pray in public over your dinner or your lunch or as you open your, you know, sandwich bag in the office, just pause and bow your head. Be a witness to a world that doesn't think about him, doesn't thank him. We need to be grateful and, and thankful because we have reasons to. Matthew Henry actually looked at Psalm 100 and, and came up with seven things to be thankful for, which we'll touch on here. Matthew Henry, the great Puritan commentator, said, number one, the Lord is God, the only living and true God, infinitely perfect, self-existent, incomprehensible. That's something to give thanks for. The Lord, He is God. Number two, He's our Creator, for it is He who made us and not we ourselves. Number three, He is therefore our rightful owner. We are His. To Him we belong. Number four, He's the sovereign ruler. We are His people, His subjects. Number five, He's our bountiful benefactor. We are not only His sheep, but the sheep of His pasture, the flock of His feeding. He gives us all good things richly to enjoy. Number six, he is the infinite and merciful God whose goodness is a fountain that never runs dry. Wow. Number seven, he's a God of truth and faithfulness. His truth endures to all generations and not one good word of his promise fails. I think there's a ton of stuff to be happy about this morning. Amen? A lot of stuff to give thanks for this morning. A lot of stuff to put a smile on your face and a spring in your step and a joy in your voice. In fact, can I just say this about Matthew Henry? He lived that, by the way. There's an occasion in which he was robbed. And when he went home that night after being robbed, he, for, he wrote in his diary four things about the robbery he was thankful for. I think you'd get to the first word of the first thought to be thankful for. But here's his four thoughts. Number one, let's, let, me, let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. I want, you to, I want you to memorize this because in Biden's world, you're probably going to get robbed. Here, here's an idea. Let me be thankful first because I, I was never robbed before. Second, although they took my purse, they didn't take my life. That's not a bad thought. And, and number three, although they took everything in my purse, it wasn't much. All right. Glad, he was glad he had a $5 bill, not a $50 bill in there. And number four, I'm glad it was me that was robbed and not someone else. Try that on for size. That's powerful. Because I think he's bought into this spirit here. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. We need to hear that. Because too much of our Christianity and too many Christians are marred by murmuring and grumbling. Just they're never happy. Never happy. 
complaining and disputing. Right? Philippians 4, 14, it's real. Paul has to say to certain Christians, do all things without murmuring. For far too many of us, life is never quite right. You know? Never quite right. And we are more than happy to tell others why we're unhappy. The meal was nice. But then we go on to say something about it. It smacks of unhappiness and ungratefulness. The day was great, but if he hadn't have done that and spoiled it, the sermon was good, but it could have been better. Better last week than this week. I like him. I like her. But... There's so many of us like that. Life is just never quite right. We forget that because of Jesus Christ, we're right with God. And that means all is right. We need to challenge ourselves to be more thoughtful and more thankful. In fact, I came across this kind of parody of Psalm 23 that I think you'll both enjoy. It'll give you a bit of a laugh, but the joke's on you and on me at times. Somebody said this. I think it was a lady called Emma Weiner. (laughs) The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Shall not want? Give me a break. I want a lot of things. I'd like to have a nicer home, a better job, a pay raise. I want people to do what I say when I say I wouldn't mind winning the lottery either. Number two, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters. I have a problem with those words, make me. That sounds a bit bossy. First you say I can't want things now. You're making me do things. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I don't want to be guided down the paths of righteousness. I prefer the more scenic routes. How about leading me to Hawaii for a change? I'm getting a little tired of the paths of righteousness. The next thing you know, you'll be leading me down a dark alley. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. What am I doing walking through the valley of the shadow of death? I thought I was supposed to be lying down in green pastures. Did you take a wrong turn? Call yourself a shepherd? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You tell me that's truth? A rod and a staff are not my idea of comfort. A rod and a reel, I'll take. A back massage would be even better. Skip the rod and the staff. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, great. Out of all the restaurants in the world, you chose the one where my enemies eat? (laughs) You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. I don't want any oil on my head. I prefer shampoo. And for goodness sake, can't you stop pouring before my cup overflows? What kind of a waiter are you? Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. I don't want to be confined to the house of the Lord forever. That sounds like a prison. It might be nice to step outside every thousand years or so. I never will understand why so many people love Psalm 23. I think you can hear yourself in that. It's challenging. It's unbecoming. It's far too easy for us to come to church as we close as consumers, looking to be entertained and served. Far too easy to come as critics looking to find fault and point out shortcomings. It's too easy even to be a cynic looking to see through the motives of others. Psalm 100 confronts that. Psalm 100 challenges that. It calls us to come not as consumers, not as critics, not as cynics. It calls us to come as celebrants. But the Lord is good. 
and his mercy is everlasting, and his truth will endure for all generations. I'm going to come before his presence with singing. I'm going to enter his gates with thanksgiving. We need to be people who understand that we're doing far better than we deserve. So stop the grumbling. Silence the murmuring. As Mark Dever says, remember anything we receive less than hell is dancing time for the Christian. Love that. It's true. One of the English officers imprisoned at Flossenburg with Dietrich Bonhoeffer you know, you know his story, Lutheran pastor, was involved in an assassination attempt on Hitler, got caught, imprisoned, was hung by a wire just days before the end of the Second World War. An English officer imprisoned with him said this, Bonhoeffer always seemed to me to spread an atmosphere of happiness and joy over the least incident and profound gratitude for the mere fact that he was alive. A profound gratitude for the mere fact he was alive. I don't know, my friend. It's a good thing this morning to be alive, clothed, and in your right mind. In Christ, on earth, going to heaven. Let's serve him with a smile. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for this, the Lord's day. We were glad this morning when they said to us, let's go to the house of the Lord. We love Sunday. We love the Lord's day. And we pray like John has described of him on Revelation 1, that on the Lord's day, may we be in the Spirit on the Lord's day. May we come having made our souls happy in the Lord, having meditated upon your word, your promises, your character, your providence, the history of salvation throughout history. May we come... And and the overspill of our joy in you, may it touch the lives of others here as we welcome on campus, as we serve them a cup of coffee, as we welcome them into the sanctuary. May we serve you with a smile. May we catch ourselves on when we start grumbling and murmuring. May we stop ourselves and give permission to others to stop us because it's unbecoming. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. The mere fact that we're alive is one thing, and alive in Jesus Christ, the living head, another thing. And someday, to borrow the words of D.L. Moody, when we get to heaven, we'll be more alive than we've ever been before. So, Lord, help that to shape our worship. Help us to, 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 to sing to you in several voices here at Kindred, somber reflection, quiet reverence, noisy celebration. It's all appropriate. It's all with, on the menu of worship. And Lord, help us as we leave now to realize that this has been worship and what we're going to do this afternoon is worship. Help us to serve you in every aspect of our life, work, rest, or play. Lord, I do thank you for the joy of this congregation I thank you that this is a happy people. I thank you that our pastors don't deal with a ton of complaints. I thank you that it's a joy and not a grief to pastor the people of Kindred Community Church. And may we join hearts and hands in 2022 and be a radiant testimony, a happy testimony for Jesus Christ in Orange County as people will eventually come our way who are tired of the broken cisterns and want the water of the living God. For we ask and pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.